Buenos dias. Good morning, everybody. Thank you all for joining us today here at VACO. Welcome. And thank you, those that are tuning in live on YouTube. First, I want to thank our veteran families, caregivers, and survivors that are here today, those that are watching us on, on YouTube again. I've been asked to share a bit of my personal journey in that it shapes one of the origin stories of how we all got here. After the Navy, I wanted to be a corporate giant, a, a titan of industry. I had attended UPenn and at Wharton School, everybody wants to be a titan of industry. Some do, some don't, I didn't. I found the corporate world, frankly, dreadfully meaningless. Instead, I started volunteering locally at a number of NGO uh, nonprofit organizations, which I found far more satisfying. Through that volunteer work, I left my corporate gig and went to work as executive director at a third of my salary for an AIDS hospice in po rural Puerto Rico, where I was living at the time. 85% of the patients there were of the LGBT community, and I grew a close bond with that community. I was impoverished but deeply gratified. I got very involved in HIV AIDS advocacy locally and in the, at the national level, namely here in, in DC. Following an invitation to join NMAC, the National Minority AIDS Council, I moved to DC and continued my HIV advocacy work here. That work led me to the first Obama administration where we stood up the Office of National AIDS Policy and wrote the nation's first national HIV AIDS strategy. Through the efforts of many, many dedicated HIV advocates, again, many of whom were of the LGBT community and a legion of doctors and scientists, HIV is now a chronic manageable disease, thank God. I cannot, however, forget the many AIDS patients that I had the honor of serving. Yes, they suffered from a deadly disease, and yes, the medical solutions at the time were very limited. What became clear to me was that many of these were suffering not from the disease naturally, but from the not so invisible wounds of stigma and discrimination. They had been ostracized and forgotten by their families, society, and the medical care system. Fast forward a number of years, I finished out the last two years of the Obama administration here at VA and returned under contract with the following administration. And in July of 2021, I was invited back by the Biden administration to direct the Center for Minority Veterans, where I am now the executive director. Soon after joining, I studied the original 1994 legislation that created the center and realized that the, the center and ourselves were not keeping up with the intent of Congress at the time to serve underserved veterans. Working with many staff offices, we quickly took to drafting new legislation, more comprehensive that includes the LGBTQ community plus many others. That bill is currently on the House floor as HR 4325, the Historically Underserved Veterans Inclusion Act of 2023 introduced by Sh Representative Sheila Scherfelis McCormick. It has a number of sponsors and it's now working its way through, through Congress. And in discussions with senior leaders, including the secretary, prompted by many LGBTQ plus veterans, many of you who, who are here, um, and rooted in my own heartfelt desire and obligation to serve, we agreed to start out, start building a platform in the Center for Minority Veterans representing uh, a, a broader range of, of minority vet and underserved veterans. Thanks to many here at VA and the ener energetic detail, uh, energetic uh, work of a detailee, where is she? Oh, there she is, uh, right there. Uh, we developed a human-centered design model to begin our outreach effort. And hence, to paraphrase Will the Krill from Happy Feet 2, I am here. But importantly, you are here. You are part of that journey. We are deeply grateful to you for that. What is etched in my soul from our first meeting is the eyes of the participants here in this room a few months ago. These brought to my recollection the many, many patients that I had served as they struggled through their final days, due in large part to the unrelenting stigma and discrimination that they were trying to overcome. Years later, I could see their faces in this very room. 
We have come a long way from those act up days of tying ourselves to the White House fence and the protests, the scarcity of, of medical resources, or even a uniform policy. But some of the overwhelming stigma and discrimination for many in the LGBTQ community still remains, and that's just not right. Yes, we have made some progress, but we have so much more to do, so let's get started. I say all this as, it, as this leads today, a first for VA, recognizing Transgender Day of Remembrance. is an annual observance on November 20th that honors the memory of transgender people gender-variant individuals, those who perceived to be transgender, whose lives were lost during acts of violence. The annual day allows us to focus on helping educate, raise awareness on issues that the transgender community faces. Today, today's event allows us the opportunity to hold for our transgender veterans who face discrimination and violence every day and to further foot stomp our veterans that we serve all day. At this time, I ask you all to join me in a moment of silence for those that we have lost. Thank you for allowing us to hold space for those we have lost. We have a very special message to share with you this morning from Admiral Rachel Levine. While she couldn't be here today with us today in person, she wanted to ensure we reach out to all of you via this video message. Admiral Levine serves as the, as the 17th Assistant Secretary for Health for the Department of Health and Human Services after being nominated by President Joe Biden and confirmed by the U.S. Senate in 2021. As Assistant Secretary for Health, Admiral Levine fights every day to improve the health and well-being of all Americans. Admiral Levine is also the head of the U.S. Public Health Service Commission Corps, one of the eight uniformed services. Hello, I am Admiral Rachel Levine, she, her pronouns, and I am the Assistant Secretary for Health at the United States Department of Health and Human Services. Transgender Day of Remembrance is a solemn day to remember those that we have lost as a result of transphobia. From my travel around this great nation of ours as the Assistant Secretary for Health, I can tell you that violence and hate are still too prominent. In this land of the free that so many advocates have fought and died for, all of us should have the ability to live our lives authentically, without fear or threats of violence. Many veterans have served this great nation proudly while not being able to be authentically themselves. President Biden and really the entire Biden-Harris administration supports us and they support an equitable future. We need to continue to work against intolerance until everyone living in America can live their life openly and freely. Now today, many politicians and their supporters are describing our transgender community as a, a blight upon our culture. Too many of the targets of this type of speech are driven to attempt suicide. We need to say publicly to every trans person living in this country that it is okay to be you. Those who now attack our community are driven by an agenda that has nothing to do with science and it has nothing to do with medicine. But I am hopeful for a more inclusive future because of the work that the Center for Minority Veterans at VA is doing every day. You, our veterans, have sacrificed so much, and I want you to know that your service matters, and you matter. We all have a role to play in making progress without leaving anyone behind. We must strongly advocate for the most underserved and marginalized in our community, including our trans youth and trans women of color. You should be able to live your life no matter who you are or who you love. Now, I am a positive and optimistic person, and I'd like to leave you with a message of hope. Thank you for everything you have done for us. There is a place for you in this great country of ours. Produced by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. That was a very encouraging message. Thank you, Admiral. Friends, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce to you to our special guests. 
Please join me in welcoming the Honorable Sean Skelly. Ms. Skelly is performing the duties of the Deputy Undersecretary for Defense of Defense for Personnel Readiness as of September 11, 2023. In this role, she serves as the primary assistant to the Undersecretary of Defense for Personal Readiness in formulating, coordinating, and integrating policies for force readiness, force management, health affairs, National Guard and Reserve, component affairs, education and training, and military civilian personnel requirements and management to include equal opportunity, morale, wel morale welfare, recreation, and quality of life matters. She's a batter asser. <laughs> Moderating today's conversation is our, our very own Chief of Staff, Kimberly Jackson. As the Chief of Staff, Ms. Jackson is a Senior Advisor to the Secretary and Deputy, Assistant, De Deputy Secretary in the federal government's second largest cabinet department with a budget of more than $246 billion and over 450,000 employees serving in VA medical centers, clinics, benefits, offices, and national cemetery. She too is cut from the same mold. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to you, Chief of Staff Jackson. Great, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone in the audience, both sitting here and dialed in for joining us today. I'm very excited to be here with uh, who is my former boss, Sean Skelly. Uh, I worked with her up until coming to the VA about two months ago. So I hope that this will be an interesting conversation and based on the fact that we already know each other a bit, hopefully um, uh, a little familiar. So Sean, why don't you start by telling us a little bit about yourself? Thank you, Kimberly. I don't think I've had uh, someone who's worked for me in left so close a time be so enthusiastic about that time. <laughs> so I'm getting better. Um, <laughs> No, um, and I want to thank James and everyone for asking me to be here today. And uh, James read off a brief summation of my bio, certainly the, the, uh, the official duties that I have. Um, when I think about, and I've had the opportunity over the last, well, 15 years, but um, especially since I became following Dr. Levine, Admiral Levine, you know, only the second trans person to be confirmed by the United States Senate. It's occurred to me that when folks ask, how did you get here? Uh, the answer is pretty simple. I'm here because I'm trans. Now I know, and you know um, with regard to Dr. Levine's remarks, there are folks who think that that's wrong, that I'm here simply only because I'm trans. But I know I'm here because I'm trans because the privilege that I had to have the space years ago and the opportunity the safety to understand who I am, the time, the resources, to access care, to become who I was born as, to become my best authentic self, is the reason I could be here today. It's not happenstance. This, folks don't normally get it through the course of my bio. Um, this is my fourth consecutive job over 11 years working for a president. Three jobs in the Obama administration, one of which as a special government employee, as a commissioner on a congressionally established commission, led me through the previous you know, intervening administrations. Um, so four consecutive presidential jobs, three appointed, one nominated, confirmed over the course of 11 consecutive years. That's only because I think I'm halfway decent at each successive job leading to the next. And that proficiency at those jobs is only possible because I was able to approach my authenticity and be the best person I could be, best version of me, which leads me to be the hopefully the best teammate and productive person I can be. So I'm here because I'm trans, period, dot. Could you talk a little bit about all of your leadership experiences um, have obviously shaped you, but could you talk a little bit about how being trans has shaped the way that you lead? Thanks, um, definitely has. Um, I, wasn't, I didn't have a lot of leadership responsibilities early in my government career, certainly not in my corporate career where I fully transitioned and came out, but I always had to be a teammate. 
And I had to be a teammate with people who didn't have the privilege or the need to know about what was happening in my day-to-day -day life all the time. Um, I worked with all the same folks after I came out that I did before I came out. They had pretty much no idea what was cooking until I came out to senior company leadership and then the news trickled downhill as far as it needed to go until I transitioned. Because of that, ever since, I received incredible grace and empathy in the corporation that I worked for, which doesn't exist now thanks to corporate mergers and acquisition and the like. It was a company that had literally, because it was 2007, 2008, no policies about gender non-conforming, trans people, people who transitioned as employees. That gave me real pause and probably set me back or I would have maybe come out to them and sought to transition with a company maybe a year earlier, but that required me to figure it out more. The solution they came out came up with when I came out to my vice president was, you know, our corporate policy is that all employees will teach you, t treat each other with dignity and they'll respect each other in our workplace. And if not, there's a problem and you report it to your supervisor and we take it from there. And they said, that should apply to you too. That's what we're gonna do because they can't flash up a corporate policy for a Fortune 1000 company out of thin air. We know that at DOD, don't we? Um, and they said, everybody should treat you like they should treat every other employee. And if that doesn't happen, they put out that message, that was the only message that went out. It went swimmingly. Also because I had very good colleagues who gave me a little bit of grace, asked questions, were very attentive and started dialogues that were just enough. It's never been more uncomfortable to me than to impose my personal life on someone else. Um, and since that experience, I've always tried to, when I've been a teammate, when I've been a successively more responsible leader, to accept people as who they are as they present themselves in the workplace but then also know I do not know everything about them, their family life, their history, and to take that with as much empathy as I could possibly provide and be supportive for how they needed support from me as a leader or a supervisor. And I can say from experience that I know that you actually, uh, you walk that walk as well. Uh, a lot of empathy in your style and willingness to see things from all sides and provide a lot of grace to uh, your subordinates. So I will, I'll give you that. Um, I think a number of folks here and dialed in have probably read the Politico article uh, that you did that came out about nine months ago or so. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested in, uh, you talk about realizing that you needed a transition as an epiphany. Uh, could you talk a little bit about what that was like and um, how that factored into your career? I never had any idea that I was trans until I realized, oh gosh, it's a family show, oh gosh, I'm trans. Um, practically a science fiction moment of the world stopping, slowing down, noise floor dropping, um, but this clarity of light that, oh, I, that is what it is, isn't it? And the degree of which of calm in which I was able to accept that in the moment, realizing that I was going to need some help pretty quick. It took months to find it in 2006. Um, but again, what I consider privilege, I was able to find help. I was able to afford help. I was able to keep accessing help and success of help, medical professionals, trained professionals, not very many back then. But again, privilege, I was here in the national capital region, which meant I stood a decent chance of finding some. Very much not the case around the country back then, and still so today. Um, with that, that was just my particular situation. Again, with empathy, Somebody finds out their child's ill. Somebody finds out they themselves have an illness or a condition or a life circumstance that requires them to deal with it, 
for their betterment, for the what we call the resiliency, the health, the well-being of themselves and their families. That becomes a responsibility we need to accommodate and support as good leaders. It redounds to the benefit of the organization for that individual as an employee, as a team member, as well as the, their, their colleagues. But it's our responsible to them as people. And that's driven me to this point. You just don't know what you don't know, but not knowing it doesn't make it less or unimportant when it does come to your knowledge that way. Not everything in someone's dark past <laughs> can be supported in the workplace, but many things can and should be. So Sean, I think it's clear, so Admiral Levine and you are, you serve as inspiration to a number of, uh, a number of government employees, whether trans or, or not. Um, could you talk a little bit about what that role is like for you, uh, that level of representation that sits on your shoulders, and reflect a little bit about how you see yourself in that image? Not an explicit job responsibility. Um, I can't talk for Admiral Levine. I can only speak to my own uh, appreciation of what serving today means. Um, I consider it an explicit responsibility in my own conduct of my sworn duties. Um, so I'm the number two confirmed trans person. Um, I was also the fourth ever out trans person appointed by a president back in the Obama administration. Um, the, that number lost meaning when we ourselves as the trans people in the Obama administration realized, hey, we lost count of how many of us there are, right? The whole point of being a one or two or anything is I think in part, you have to do your job, you have to take care of yourself, which is an obligation, but setting conditions to lower the barriers of expectation. We can only change the world one person at a time as we encounter them. Um, we can, I'm always humbled um, when folks say I inspire them or they look up to me or they see that um, serving in government, just being out and being productive and hopefully successful is possible through looking at people like Admiral Levine and me. Um, so that has driven me now for the better part of a decade is that recognition. Um, if I'm not a good employee, if I'm not a good leader, if I'm not a good teammate, if I'm not a nice person in line in the food court, that could attend to people's appreciation of trans employees in general or trans people in general. Um, that's a real thing. Trans people are one of the smallest slices of America you can slice. We're represented in all the demographics, socioeconomic, location, ethnicity, all of it, but we're still one of the smallest slices of America and so few Americans have ever genuinely interacted and know a trans person. Um, and so I've come to see and believe we change the world one person at a time. If somebody can see my humanity, somebody can see me as a flawed person just like them, but also see me as hopefully a public servant, a patriot, a veteran, all of those things I think I've earned. It'd be nice if we started with seeing me as a human being, right? Um, a lot is possible from there. And hopefully, if I'm any good at my job, they'll see that people like me can be good at our jobs, at all jobs, because we're doctors, lawyers, engineers. I've known truck drivers, plumbers, scientists, chefs, teachers, as I always like to say conspiratorially about LGBTQ plus people, we're everywhere, right? It's just true. It's a good whisper. Yeah, especially with the echo. <laughs> oh, fair enough. I, 
I think that it also is a lot of responsibility, though, mm -hmm. um, to constantly have to act the part and to provide the example. How do you manage that? My dad was a Marine. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, your responsibility to your job, especially in jobs like the ones we are holding right now, means it is bigger than you. Um, we try and leave it at home. We try and leave it at the office. Doesn't quite work like that. Um, especially not with some of the responsibilities we have at DOD. They're 24-7, 365, global, period. So it does affect my conduct of the job. Marginally, because my dad was that Marine, I grew up with a commitment to service to any team I was a part of. It's team first, goal, mission, win the game, play defense, get dirty, don't worry about praise, worry about effort, be there when the bell goes off, be there until the clock stops or the lights go down. Um, that has served me well. I also have had many conversations with my therapists over <laughs> that over time as to when to take a knee and I'm still trying to get better at when to take an E in self-care. Also familiar with that. <laughs> uh, well, speaking of your job, Sean, um, it wouldn't be me if I didn't bring up strategic readiness. So I was, I was hopeful that, you're welcome. Uh, I was hopeful that you could talk a little bit about the tie between supporting LGBTQ plus rights mm -hmm. and strategic readiness. Would you like to explain for the audience what strategic readiness is? Well, no longer my job, Sean, so. <laughs> I, am, I am happy to. We both miss this, don't we? <laughs> so, uh, as I mentioned, we worked together before, and I was the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Force Readiness, and what we were charged with was pushing the Department of Defense to think not just about near-term operational readiness, but more broadly about how do we ensure that the Joint Force is ready now and over time? How do we articulate the trade-offs when we have to make a decision today, and how do we incorporate all of the different aspects of readiness that are considered a bit ancillary but are inherently supportive to ensuring that joint force preparedness, things like human capital, allies and partners, modernization, mobilization. Thank you. As Secretary Austin stated within days of the start of his tenure and repeats often, people are the Department of Defense's most critical asset. There's no mission readiness, readiness of any form without people. People are the essential core of readiness. The drones will not save us before they probably take over the world, <laughs> but it's not just about the equipment. People have to create the requirement design the equipment, design the requirement. Somebody out in the industrial base has to design the thing, build the thing. We have to take care of it, we have to operate it, whether we're sitting in it or not, no matter what it is, people are always involved, always. And we don't have enough of them. We don't, that's pretty well documented as what's referred to as a recruiting crisis, it's a challenge. We're, this year marks the 50th anniversary of the all-volunteer force. The world has markedly changed over those 50 years, as has our economy, our society, all the forces that are out there. Um, we are not recruiting as many people as we would like to, which is a vibrant conversation at DOD. Because of that, but also in general, we need to give everybody a fair shot who has the talent that the department and its mission that American people require to defend them and to defend our democracy. That talent lies everywhere. Again, it's not just trans people or LGBTQ people. The ability to do the, the 
thousands of jobs, both in uniform and civilian clothes, that the Department of Defense requires. That talent is resident in every bucket of America that you could, you could imagine. Doesn't mean everybody's propensed. Doesn't mean everybody is qualified in that bucket or that segment, but they're there. So if you get hung up on what somebody looks like, where they came from, what accent they might have, we're suboptimal and we're missing talent and we're missing it for what it is. Anybody who wants to try or anybody who doesn't know that they can try and doesn't know what lies on the other side of trying and joining, how their lives are advanced, enhanced, how they can take care of their families, how their opportunities are unknown to them, I won't say quite endless, If we can't convey that message to as many Americans as possible and then see it reflected back in whichever Americans come forward, we're gonna come up short. We have to recognize talent is talent, patriotism is patriotism, a qualifying score is a qualifying score, period. So closely related to that, how do you think that we as a federal government can do a better job in advocating for LGBTQ rights and creating safe spaces in the workplace for those individuals? Thanks. Um, I just caught a random social media post several weeks ago that I saved um, that I've already used once in the past week. Um, I think the statement occurred by a member of Congress on the floor of the House um, referring to um, that member's, I believe, gay child in their marriage. And the, uh, the, the quote's pretty short, but I think it resonates. You can't legislate love, but you can give love the protection of law. And that goes... I think that applies to policies as well. It goes back to what I learned from my company in 2008. We should all treat each other right, decently, with respect, if not consequence. We already have laws that do that with regard to murder, assault, sexual assault, harassment, all of those things. At the end of the day, those laws are not preventing murder, assault, sexual assault, you know, online, it comes down to individual people to make them real and to make them accountable for those that cross those lines. We have in the federal government all those policies mm -hmm. with regard to the inclusion of LGBTQ plus Americans as our fellow employees and public servants. Everyone, at least in public service, should get that respect that's due every American under our laws. And we have to enforce it as individuals and then as supervisors and leaders, such as the cabinet secretaries who lead departments. I think it's both legal and personal in, in that regard. Paper's only as good as what you do about it and hold yourself and others accountable to it. Yeah, absolutely. So what advice do you uh, or would you like to provide to uh, members of the military or the veteran community who identify as LGBTQ plus? What have you learned in your career that might be useful? The one thing I think that's most powerful that I still myself strive to actuate or access is asking for help. There's been a campaign for years now in the Department of Defense. Our senior uniform leaders are walking that talk. When they go and ask for help, asking for help is a sign of strength. It can be difficult, it can be scary. Sometimes that asking that help or accessing it becomes visible and that can be a little bit of a barrier. Mm -hmm. I know it was in my case. Um, Asking for help is a good thing. Asking for help will also tell you who's around you and whether or not they've really got your back. At the same time, 
It's just not the colleagues around you that are obligated to help you or your supervisor or the leader above them. The system is obligated to help you. Sometimes it can be tough. It's a helpline, it's a website. I think we still have bulletin boards where those things are still posted. We have it on with DOD. We have Military One Source that has so much information. We're finding that we're gonna have to work harder at helping people navigate to all the information that's there to help them and their families. Asking for help, sign of strength, first step. Second one is, I know, still to this day, uh, experienced it intensely 15 years ago, 10 years ago. One of the most harmful, difficult things to deal with is feeling that you're alone. Standing in formation, standing you know, wherever the fire drill after everybody leaves the building and pours out into the parking lot. Standing waiting for the metro, you name it, you can feel in the middle of a crowded room, alone, isolated, out of touch, and don't know how you're gonna connect, reach out. The one thing, the most powerful thing I ever learned is how eager and ready most people, many people are to lend you their ear and to try and help you or help you find the right help. It's the most powerful thing I've ever known. It's a thing I try and pay forward, pay back every time I get the opportunity. Um, I strive to even be better at it. Um, asking for help and reaching out when you feel alone. Loneliness can be incredibly destructive if it's allowed to fester. So. There might not be somebody in your office, your unit, if your workplace who has that firsthand experience that you might need to hear from, it can be found pretty quick. If you, the first step is to reach out. And I think that that message resonates for this entire community at the VA, especially those of us who have served. And to your point that you want people to see you as a human first, I think another major aspect of your identity is being a veteran, exclusive of anything mm -hmm. else. Could you talk a little bit about how you have found belonging as a veteran uh, when you have felt lonely, when you have needed to reach out? Being a veteran is being part of an incredible community. Um, it's also a, a thing that for me has unlocked uh, those times when I have felt a little alone or a little awkward or has helped break down barriers between me and people who aren't sure about me. For years now, I can't do anything where people aren't either holding my bio, read my bio, um, or read my bio after I walk in the room. Um, and increasingly, that includes, includes the personal details about me, especially now after having been nominated and confirmed all over but the cry. And my life story precedes me into virtually every room. With that, people respect veterans, excuse me. Most Americans overwhelmingly respect and are grateful for people's service to their country in uniform, which I think is right. That's a degree of accessibility. Other veterans go, what service, what'd you do? And then it's us telling each other how much better we were than them. But it humanizes you instantly as, as an American and as a veteran, or folks who didn't serve like, who, who is this person? Oh, you did, you did a career. And let's face it, flying an F off of aircraft carriers is the coolest possible thing anyone could ever do. So that drops it down just a little bit too. But it, it, we generally have more in common as human beings, as Americans, than we have differences. And if you can start with those commonalities, we can go a long way. Um, but it has been that point of connection for a lot of people who are like, who, who is this? Why is she here? 
where is she going to come from? People get me, trans, and the sentence can stop there. But when they see veteran, a lot of time in government now, different kinds have been there, done that. You get, because again, it goes back to, can you do your job? As veterans, we all experienced, are you any good at the thing we're all here to do? And for a lot of us, that are you any good gets to, are you gonna get us killed? Right? That kind of trust. There are plenty of people I have flew with. I'm not picking up the phone for. You know who you are. <laughs> but <laughs> that's but, but they were great in the airplane. And we sure had a good time. And we also trusted each other then. That was the most important thing about our relationship. Could we trust each other as aviators? Could we trust them as squadron members, as sailors? Somebody to pick up and lead the fire hose team, right? Those were the things that mattered. Then whether or not we spent all our time together on liberty, tertiary, beyond that. Um, same thing goes in the workplace. Are you good at your job? Are you a good colleague on down the line? It starts there. We're in rooms, we're in these places, and organizations for a purpose. Then we get to decide what our social life looks like. And if you can start from that framework, again, everything is possible. The world's complex. Sometimes we have to break it down. And I think that it is absolutely wonderful that you have been able to receive so much support from such a wide swath of colleagues and friends and family over time since you transitioned. But of course, there are going to be times when you aren't treated the way that you should be treated. What is your approach when that happens? What is your philosophy? That's another thing where um, the past several years, because of the governmental rank I've carried with me, People are probably not going to get in my face and be disrespectful, period. Again, privilege. I've been the recipient of innumerable forms of privilege over the past 15, 17, 18 years now. These last few years, that's one. Um, in the past, I dealt with folks who didn't like, they didn't know who they were talking to or were uncomfortable with it. Um, you can't get down, personally, you can't get down and roll in that mud of disrespect and disrespect somebody back. Frankly, the, the most risk I'm at every day is someone might look at a skew or askance at me. That's nothing compared to what many trans Americans have to face including trans veterans, people who are at literal risk for their physical safety because of what being trans means to them has led to the circumstances that they're in. Trans people are some of the most, not only the smallest group, of one of the smallest groups of Americans, they're also one of the extremely most vulnerable Americans housing insecurity, food insecurity, healthcare access, unemployment, all orders of magnitude multiple times the national average. Very few of those people experience only one of those vulnerabilities. Oftentimes, there are multiple elements of insecurity and vulnerability. Um, under earners, most subject to violence, Trans Day of Remembrance is about those who have been lost to violence. I certainly came up over the past 17 years knowing potentially someone could attack me on the street because they read me or believe me to be trans. Women have get attacked now with increasingly frequency confronted trying to enter restrooms because somebody has the wild idea. Your hair's short, you're wearing jeans, whatever, you're, you must be trans. And they intervene, they 
block them. They follow him to restrooms. I'm not at risk, practically. Risk always is there. The old aviator in me knows when to start calculating risk, when I feel to and when and how. There are trans Americans and veterans who are at physical risk an incredibly disproportionate part of the time and find themselves in risky situations just trying to stay alive, trying to fend for themselves, trying to make money, trying to find a place to live, um, trying to find someone who will care for them as a human being. Um, so when I think about my circumstance, it doesn't even pale in comparison. It's not in the same universe. I know we're in the same world, we're in the same America. Um, I'm sometimes discomforted by, I can't do very much in that world in the position I'm in today. I was moving into that space um, over the last few years before I was back in full-time federal service. And I look on, I look forward to getting back into the larger advocacy um, community to help in the advancement of the place of transgender Americans. There are folks who do that work and I can't sing their praises high enough. Um, VA is in that work making care and support accessible to those who um, have earned VA care. And I'm grateful for what the Center for Minority Veterans does. There wasn't always one, and there are lots of kinds of veteran, excuse me, minorities and people who um, have difficulty accessing care and have difficulty being seen as part of the veteran community. We, movies and everything, our culture has tended to stereotype the people who serve. Um, we deal with that ourselves in DOD and accessing people do you look like this kind of soldier, that kind of sailor, or that kind of airman? Doesn't matter what you look like, except for uniform standards, which are changing. But it's, do you, are you a person that can do the job? Um, but meanwhile, when you go back out into society, we know it with women veterans all the time. They walk into a facility so you must be the spouse, the partner, the daughter. Actually, you know, I'm a decorated combat veteran. And a little bit of record scratch goes on on the other side because we're still not accustomed to that, despite it being, again, 50 years since the last um, women's corps was fully disestablished, right? Those things take time. It's a little bit of generational change, um, but it's about the recognition that just about anybody can be just about anything. And check in with that first and kind of leave in your personal biases, which may not be you know, um, overt. Sometimes you just accrue them in that way. And that's what um, organizations like VA, I believe, and have seen do to work to be incredibly deliberate about outreach and access. And it's, it's, it's hugely commendable. We're doing our version of that in DOD continuing to look under the hood as to why aren't people accessing and able to find all the things that are there for them. Um, and I think that's the sign of healthy organizations that they just don't say, we're doing it, what do you want? No, it can be delivered better to more, more effectively, more efficiently. I think this conversation is a, is a component representative of, of that ethos on VA and I wanna say thank you to everyone, to include Secretary McDonough, um, for having an organization that does work like this in this manner. And thank you, ma'am. On behalf of the department, there are so many individuals here who spend so much time to support policies like you're talking about being here for seven weeks. I can't take credit at this point, but the team is amazing. Um, I, sh I should have asked before, I, are we doing audience questions? Okay. So I'm just doing a quick time check. I have two questions left, but maybe I'll come up with a few more, not, not shy with the words. I know, shockingly. Um, the first is, could you tell us a little bit about your time as a roadie for Hootie and the Blowfish? 
I, I told you, you had the, the danger of doing this with somebody who knows a little bit about you. <laughs> um, I'll get to the end. Darius, you're out there somewhere. They still owe me money. <laughs> Uh, for the cracked windshield, they, one of their albums, Crack Rear View. I had a crack front windshield from an amp connecting from a shortstop in my Toyota Tercel, and it smacked into the windshield because it was strapped into the front seat. They owe me money. Um, they're great. We were all on the same dorm floor, fifth floor more. Um, it's been plowed under for a couple of decades at USC. Um, it turned out. Um, Darius Rucker and I were in the same year. A couple of random uh, guys from Maryland showed up around the corner on the floor. Uh, those turned out to be uh, Mark Bryan and Dean Felber, um, guitar and bass and Hootie. Um, and they started playing at the bar across the street. Uh, they needed somebody to lug stuff back and forth, which meant you could get in, which meant you could get on some of the band's pitchers of beer my kind of labor, um, and that continued for three years. Um, I guess I'd use the word cute now, that in a way that I didn't use as a, as a college senior. Um, it came time for me, uh, support of them on trips and the like, and they said, hey, we, need, we, we just got a couple gigs um, up South Carolina, it's north to uh, North Carolina. Um, but it's like, hey, we've got some gigs up in Raleigh-Durham. You're down, right? We need to carry all this gear. I'm like, I can't. What do you mean you can't? I have to go to flight school, dummies. You know, <laughs> I've told you that for months. I'm not going to be here in August. I've got a report. Didn't compute. Um, I have friends that are still connected to them this day. Um, just miss them when they, uh, Darius came through on tour. One of our friends is still his tour manager um, there. Um, incredible time. It was, uh, I don't think very few, very many average people have the experience of getting into an elevator in Las Vegas. Hearing the elevator music is a tune your friends released and you were there when it was written. <laughs> Well, or now that music is dated enough that it plays in uh, my local giant supermarket about twice a year <laughs> in that way. Um, it, it was fascinating to get that insight. And when one of your college friends has, it, has his own float at the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. So, wild. Just wanted to make sure that in addition to being a trans woman, a veteran, a government official, that Hootie Rhodey uh, was also- yeah, multi-platinum artist, yep. That's exactly right. Now that's out there, thank you. You're, wel you're welcome. Of, of all the things I could want to keep hidden. <laughs> I am what I am. Yeah. But I do think it goes to the point of getting people to uh, know you and understand you as an individual. And as somebody who worked with you for the better part of, of three years, uh, it would be those, uh, those small stories that would just accidentally slip out that really, that really humanized you in a way that uh, made you more than just my boss, but a really genuinely interesting human being. Um, and I thought that that would be useful to, to share with folks. I appreciate you being a good sport. Uh, the last question that I have for you, really, it turns it back on you. What should I have asked? What do you wish people would ask uh, that you'd like to use this opportunity to talk about now? Uh, I think we touched on it a, a little bit. I can't speak for um, Dr. Secretary Admiral Levine. Um, I can only speak for myself, but we're kind of standing on the same spot on the twister board right now, and the only two confirm people and what that conveys. It's huge. Um, but I know I don't represent the state of the average transgender American. I, I don't. I talked about privilege. Um, I don't think I'm being 
humble. I think I'm being as starkly realistic as I can. I had it easy, and I thought my experience was terrible, and I never want to, I wouldn't wish it on anybody. Anybody. My family didn't reject me. My employer didn't throw me out. I wasn't assaulted by anybody going about my business through the course of my transition or after. The President of the United States speaks my name a couple times a year. You asked me in 2006, I've told this story and it's, I think it's on record somewhere. I was closeted, attached to the Marine Corps when it was all going on, left closeted, getting medical care under the table, supporting a, I went to a meeting in the tank. I was this, the subject matter ep, expert for a meeting in the vaunted joint staff tank. Walking to that meeting, E-ring of the Pentagon in my Marine Corps digitals, because that's what you did, attached to the Marine Corps. Trying not to cry my eyes out because I was only a couple months away from retirement realizing or thinking, believing, I will never walk in this building again. How could I ever get back and work here? And yet I did. Now a car rolls up and picks me up when I need to come to a place like this, right? That is not the average experience of a trans person. That is a fantastic collision of circumstance that has allowed it to be possible. As I opened, I'm here because I'm trans, because that has unlocked the best of me. Everybody else gets to judge how good that is, but snowball's chance in heck that I could ever be here without realizing my authenticity. The number of people who don't get that chance, far too many. Um, I don't like talking about me. I hate it. Um, but I accept and people have convinced me that it's important. And in this job, I, as we know, not a lot of time to do other things. Um, and also some constraints on what I can and can't do and what I can and can't say. Dr. Levine, Admiral Levine and I represent what's possible for trans Americans. There are scientists, engineers, lawyers out there crushing it in their fields. And there are people in the entertainment industry who I think, frankly, get a little too much play. They're, they're great entertainers. They don't represent all of trans America because trans America looks like America. And those folks are, some of them are fighting for their lives. Families and with young people, I have friends whose children are uh, gender nonconforming trans. They're very scared for the, for the future of their family and their children. Um, I've met trans service members. I've spoken to them when I can, when they reach out to me. The answer is always yes. They're fearful of what their enduring possibility of a career is. That's been fairly um, going with the wind the last couple of administrations while they all successfully serve. People talked about it with black Americans in uniform, women in uniform, serving in all the roles. People talked about it with gay and lesbians. They talked about it with trans. The world will end, the military will cease to function if they're allowed to be in, out, open, doing all the jobs. It's never come true. It won't. Um, I'm one small part of trans America. They need a lot more attention, a lot more support, and a lot more visibility. Uh, Anything that we do or see today redounds to that effect. I'm glad for it. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Sean. This has been wonderful. I really appreciate your time and coming all the way to the VA and hope to do this again sometime. Just not with microphones and YouTube. <laughs> yeah, 
Um, let's give our, our speakers a, a stronger round of applause for their honesty and, and courage. Uh, Ms. Kelly, Ms. Levine, and Ms. Jackson, thank you very much. Um, a couple of things stand out to me. Uh, one is that we're all Navy, and of course, the three of us are Navy, and Navy leading the way, as usual. Uh, sorry for you Marine guys that are out there. Um, the second is the comment around changing the world and things one person at a time. And at the center, we are very intentional and deliberate in reaching out to minority and underserved veterans if it takes one person at a time, and we do that. Um, I wanna say to the community and all minority and underserved veterans that, that, that we see you. We see you. This is our third or fourth event here. Uh, after many years of not being here, uh, we see you and we will continue to invite you back and engage you and encourage you to participate in the, in the VA. We haven't always been that way. And we want to tell the community that, that give us another chance. Give us another chance. Come back to us. Uh, you have a family and a home here at VA and you earned this and you merit this. Um, and finally, we wouldn't be a VA event if we didn't have a group shot. So uh, I ask everybody to uh, stick around for a few seconds while we gather and, and get a group shot as a, as a team. Thank you very much again. Thank you.